Um, I'd like to welcome you, Thorsten Polite, to our humble studio. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here from Frankfurt, right? Thank you very much, Mr. Tucker. That's right. I come from Frankfurt. It's it's a great uh, opportunity to to be here and uh, enjoying myself greatly. I should clarify, you're here at the Austrian Scholars Conference, so you get to be around all your friends, your fans, your colleagues. Yeah, it's good to, to come together with like-minded people, you know, once in a while to exchange ideas and having a good time. I think the Mises Institute is doing a fantastic job. It, I, you know, I really enjoy being here and I think it's very much shared by others. So in Frankfurt, you don't, you're not surrounded by colleagues? Uh, oh, well, I think the, the, this is a completely different platform over here. I mean, this is the EP center of mm -hmm. uh, Austrian economics, people coming from, from all over the world. Yeah. And uh, so it makes it really special to be here. In Frankfurt, um, uh, liberal uh, libertarian-minded economists are pretty rare. So um, there's still a lot of thing, a lot of things to do to win people over. Now you you um, you both teach at a university, but also work in a private uh, consulting with a with a bank, as I recall. That's right. Yeah, I I work as a as a bank economist. You know, yeah, yeah doing fractional uh, reserve bank, no doubt. Absolutely. <laughs> you see, the the problem with with, <laughs> with our monetary system you're referring to is uh, it's not only with banks; it's it's all over the place because even the the vendor next door is dealing with fiat money. Uh, and uh, exchanging goods and services against this this paper currency, and so the problem that comes with fiat money is not only with with, with banks or bankers, and indeed I I try as best as I can, you know, uh, looking at data, uh, trying to make sense uh, of what's unfolding, and uh, coming forward with hopefully uh, good advice for institutional investors like pension funds, uh, insurance companies, etc. Well, your articles on Mises.org do have this uh, nice combination, and this is why I'm always drawn to them. And I, I mean, you're, you're a star in any case, but I like the way you integrate high theory, you know, drawn from all times with current events. And that's a, it's a nice integration. It's seamless, really, in the way you write and in your work. Oh, that's very generous. I, um, I think it, indeed it's it's uh, it's a good way of uh, basically conveying the message of the Austrian School of Economics. If you can tie it in in day-to-day -day events, if you can make sense out of what's happening in globalized financial markets, and uh, you know, putting in a chart can be quite helpful for 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 oh yeah, getting across the message. You know, and you do more than just put in a few charts. I mean, you really are analyzing very closely what's happening. You follow markets very carefully. In fact, you arrived here yesterday with a, with a bit of news, actually. You, and you announced this bit of news to me as if I, I, I knew it, but I didn't. <laughs> what, what, what was that again? You, um, it was something about a bond fall, fund failing or something? Oh, oh yeah. There was, a, there was a, a news saying that one of the largest American bond portfolio managers yes. would, would no longer buy U.S. treasuries. Yeah, that's right. And it was a business page. That I, should, I don't even need to read the business page. I should just, yeah. you know, get you on Skype and you can tell me. But, but later I learned, I mean, that that, that wasn't, you know, was made public. Uh, and the, the, But they they have already started dumping uh, the Treasury bonds since February, I learned. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's important, you know, to... Um, to analyze and, and follow uh, what's really unfolding in, in the financial sector, in the real economy these days, because it helps to um, put to work the splendid ideas of the Austrian School right. of Economics. Well, uh, so you see uh, people leaving the dollar, leaving uh, uh, U.S. government debt, but w where, where to go? I mean, what's left? I mean, you've got the, uh, you know, as well as anybody about the problems in Europe. Well, I would say at the moment we haven't reached a situation where people are really fleeing out of fiat currencies, be that the dollar, be that the euro or the Japanese yen. Um, but what can be observed uh, is that there are growing signs of, of people becoming increasingly concerned about the value of their lifetime savings, of their currencies. And um, so, what? Uh, from my point of view, it's really what what Hayek and Ludwig von Mises uh, told us about the uh, the fiat uh, currency system, namely that it is uh, is not a, a sustainable economic monetary order, so to speak. And uh, I think we are at an early stage where 
were the first signs of its... Uh, well, the fiat currencies as we know them have only existed since about 1973, so it's yeah, a fairly, uh, fairly... Yeah, fairly, fairly, fairly new. Yeah. And uh, it's really a great experiment for many mainstream economists, like uh, Milton Friedman, you know, told us that uh, this is an... Uh, unheard of monetary experiment, as right. as he put it, and <laughs> the Austrians, of course, have a much stronger uh, have a much stronger message to say about uh, fiat currency, namely that it is uh, really an unsustainable uh, monetary arrangement. How closely do you follow Fed policy? Very closely. I mean, central bank policies. Be that, of course, the Fed is the most important world on the, uh, the most important uh, central bank on on the world. Mm -hmm. And central banks still have a great impact on the price action in the financial markets, be that in the money market, be that at the long term, uh, at the long end of uh, the, the, the yield curve, they, their actions affect stock pricing and uh, derivative pricing. So I try to follow very closely what they do. What is your sense of, um, I think Bernanke recently announced that he was going to keep rates uh, at uh, practically zero. Um, because he fears that uh, raising rates would uh, somehow harm the supposed recovery. So what, what's your analysis of that? Well, I, th I think it's, uh, first of all, uh, based on a kind of Keynesian thinking where the interest rate is basically a policy instrument variable which has to be lower to the lowest uh, level possible in order to stimulate consumption and investment. Um, so... And, and I would say, in in this context, his assessment is basically shared by most central bankers around the world. Of course, from the viewpoint of the Austrian School of Economics, you would clearly see that this is really the wrong policy, right. because it's uh, a policy against the corrective forces of the free market. The economy cannot really get rid of all the malinvestment under a policy which keeps the interest rates at artificially lower interest uh, yeah. levels. Artificially, but uh, I mean, it's, it, is it your sense that if, 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 if central bankers suddenly began to treat interest, the interest rate as just a pure free market price, that we would see uh, rates uh, skyrocket? Or, or does more have to be done? For example, the moral hazard built into the system lowers rates lower than they would otherwise be, right? In a fiat money system where money is produced through bank circulation credit, as Mises uh, put it, uh, the market interest rate is necessarily below the level that would prevail uh, under a, a commodity money system. So by definition, our system suffers from a distorted uh, interest rate uh, level, and that causes all this malinvestment. I must say, uh, in terms of the correct monetary policy, I, it's really hard to come up rec with a recommendation in the current system. The fiat money system uh, is basically uh, and necessarily so related with, with, with causing malinvestment and disequilibria. Right. Now, so often um, the idea of, well, I think Mises writes this, he said everybody wants interest rates to be very low mm -hmm. and somehow higher interest rates, high interest rates have this bad reputation and, and Austrians in particular seem to be going around going, well, we should have you know, higher interest rates and nobody wants to hear this. And yet... Um, low rates have punished savers. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the interest rate is, is a free market phenomenon, you know, theoretically speaking. It's, it's expressive of societal time preference, you know. Of, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a guide which, says, uh, which tells us how to save and how to consume out of current uh, income in order to accumulate uh, capital, in order to improve the future uh, consumption possibilities. And uh, we have a monetary system which basically distorts this important uh, guide stick, you know, and that causes all these uh, boom and bust cycles, the malinvestment, and um, it's, I think, yeah, uh, the, the economist Eugen von böhm Bawerk, you know, he, uh, back at the early uh, 20th century, basically, he, he expressed uh, concern that uh, the interest rate wouldn't uh, get rid of its, as he called it, moral shade, you know, 
people would prefer a low interest rate over a higher interest rate. Um, and that is, uh, of course, uh, conducive for policymakers um, implementing policies for pushing down the interest rate, you know. But, uh, but it's a problem for investors, isn't it? I mean, uh, risk-averse investors, investors uh, once were able to know exactly what to do with their money, you, um, you, you, you deposit it and let it let it earn a nice rate of return. Now, yeah, what do you do? Is it a problem for you as a, as an advisor to, to to money funds? I mean, what, what what do you do with your money under these policies? Uh, on the one hand, of course, low interest rates, artificially low interest rates, harm uh, in uh, savers. Uh, and, and I may add, we have reached a situation where uh, short-term interest rates are not only low, but they have become negative yes. in real terms. Right. So people lose money by holding time and saving deposits. They're getting punished for saving. Yes. Uh, and of course, that is uh, of, uh, benefiting uh, borrowers, you know, because uh, their, their real debt burden is getting diminished by this, by this. Uh, yeah. By this low interest rate effect. But borrowers benefit from low interest rates, but lenders don't, right? I mean, it's a problem because the low rates have discouraged uh, lending, so you've got a kind of a stalemate. Yeah. I mean, monetary policy, as, as it is structured today with a, with a government-sponsored central bank, uh, leads, of course, to uh, a situation in which some benefit and... Uh, some uh, have to basically shoulder the the cost burden. Right. Um, we uh, we are indeed in a situation at the moment where uh, funding costs, uh, you know, are getting lowered through central bank policies, but to a very low level, and um, that makes, of course, it more difficult for, let's say, uh, lenders, you know, to provide adequate credit to, to many businesses. So you have basically two, created two problems, on the one hand for savers and on the other hand for, for the lending industry. Yeah, well, they can't make any money at this racket. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, what is, um, now we, uh, you've, you've explained in many of your articles that uh, we have a kind of that fiat money inflation and uh, credit addiction. It's like a global disease, right? Um, do you expect a conventional response to um, QE1 and QE2 and all the efforts of quantitative easing? Do you expect uh, inflation pressures to continue to, to rise over the next few years? Or what do you, what do you think about I mean, Apparently, uh, central banks only have so much power to unleash a torrent of, of paper, right? That requires the cooperation of the banking industry. The banking industry isn't cooperating entirely. You know, I, I, I come from a country where we learned our lesson uh, very well in terms of increasing the paper money supplies. You know, right. in the 1920s, 1923, the, the Reichsmark uh, was destroyed through hyperinflation. And maybe that is because uh, Germans are still traumatized by, yeah. by inflation and hyperinflation, whereas the Americans, I think, got traumatized by the Great Depression. You know, you guys are afraid of deflation. That's a good way to look at it, yeah. And... Um, but having said that, uh, our monetary system is such that the central bank can increase the money supply at any point in time in any quantity desired. You wouldn't need the cooperation of the commercial banking industry for doing that. And what I'm trying to say is if there's a political willingness to increase the money supply and increase inflation, you get more money and more inflation. A central bank can, for instance, start buying bonds mm -hmm. against issuing new money. It can buy bonds from banks, from insurance companies, or even from private individuals. Mm -hmm. They could even buy other assets against issuing new money. Um, so the system is really uh, one in which the money supply can be increased and inflation can be orchestrated if there's a political willingness to do it. And also, I mean, that I think is the greatest danger if there's false economic theory which promises that increasing the money supply is going to improve jobs and output. The, the risk uh, is clearly in greatly increased that policymakers would reduce to such a policy. Now Bernanke thinks that he can just turn it off if it gets to be a problem. 
I mean, technically speaking, uh, of course, the central bank has a monopoly in this fiat money regime to increase the money supply or to determine the money supply. And of course, they could rein in any kind of money uh, issued. Um, but of course, uh, as you know, once the money uh, has been uh, expended, uh, has, uh, has been provided to the economy, uh, it will hurt uh, yeah. people once it is redeemed. And for political reasons, uh, and when you look at monetary history, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, mostly once the money supply has been increased, it's never getting reduced. Yeah. It's uh, worked out through higher prices, so to speak. Right. I can't think of a single case where a central bank has ever deliberately deflated, maybe in... No, and, and some certainly not, because <laughs> they were created uh, bec uh, for, now, for increasing the money supply. You studied Weimar and the hyperinflation at length, right? In fact, you have some family stories about this. You, uh, so you have a family memory, even. Uh, but wasn't it rather sudden? I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of warning going into that hyperinflation, was there? Well, I think, uh, you know... That was the period of great revolution, you know, after the end of World War I. Yeah. Um, basically, America brought democracy <laughs> to continental Europe, uh, the monarchy, you know. I expect a yeah. thank you from you. <laughs> 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 well, let's leave it open at, at this juncture. Okay. And so uh, there were many problems, you know, with 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 the larger consequences of of, of the war period, and Germany had to uh, pay reparations, you know, through the Allied, uh, made Germany to uh, hand over, you know, uh, industries and gold and and, and, and other stuff. And in uh, in in the late uh, in late 1922, early 1923, there was the occupation of the of the Ruhrgebiet, the industrial area of Germany, through French and Belgian troops. And the former uh, Chancellor, the German Chancellor uh, Wilhelm Kuno, called for passive resistance. He basically called upon all civil servants and industrial workers to go home, to prevent the Belgian and French troops to obtain any any goods and uh, you know any any real stuff and um, he promised to pay the, the the wages with newly created money and uh, there the problem started people people it, i mean it was a politically orchestrated uh, inflationary process which then got out of hand yes. because prices started rising and so people were talking economists were talking there were too few money around so they increased the uh, money There's production. a shortage of money it's very yeah. strange isn't yes. it it's and they they call these days I, I think they call it havenstein momentum because rudolf havenstein that was the, the Reichsbank president and it, it led to this catastroph uh, cat catastroph catastrophic uh, collapse of the of and complete destruction of the of the Reichsmark. Yeah, uh, what percent inflation? I mean, do do we have figures on this? Is, I, is, 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 is astronomical. Yeah. I mean, this this um, it became scrap money. What? Yeah. And, and I think Mises uh, was um, really referring to this episode when he when he wrote about the crack up boom. Oh, crack up boom. Because at the end of that period, as from late summer. 1923 until November, things span out of control. Right, and that's precisely uh, the point, that it's out of control, right? And so uh, you can have every intention of, of trying to prevent such a calamity, but at some point, yeah. inflation uh, expectations kick in. Uh, exactly. Then the money, money demand breaks down. Yeah. People try to exchange their paper notes or their money against real assets, and that is what Mises called the crack-up boom. So it's a very interesting thing to read about because, uh, well, one it can't entirely rule out such a future for the dollar. I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, the German hyperinflation was, was special. Uh, first of all, it, 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 it led to a complete destruction of the Reichsmark. The, the money was really dead and had to be replaced by new currency. Right. Whereas when when you look at, for instance, Latin America, they had hyperinflations in the early 1990s. Mm. The currencies were greatly debased, but they were still used as money. Right. So in a way, the German hyperinflation was, was special. It was a perfect destruction, basically, of, 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 of the currency. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you are a, a little bit unusual as a monetary thinker and economist in the sense that um, I get the sense that your true heart is with uh, Mises' gold standard. I mean, you like Mises' gold standard, the idea of the gold standard. Let me start by saying uh, there are certain uh, physical properties a medium has to uh, to fulfill has to, you know, certain requirements have to be met by a certain medium for serving as money. Right. And uh, gold and silver and obviously... Um, well, they, they, lend yeah. them, they lend themselves very, very... Uh, yeah, well, they, it's, it's homogenous, you know, yeah. it's homogenous, it's, it's, it's scarce, it can be minted, transported. So, um, and having said that, I think uh, precious metals can do a great job in, uh, as far as the money function is concerned. Mm. When it comes to the gold standard, personally, I, I would think a privatization of money production would be the way forward. And I could imagine that this is something uh, Mises, uh, which is in the Misesian tradition. Uh, going for a gold standard um, would actually imply that you impose a certain medium, namely gold, as money. Or just convert the currency and define it in some way. Yeah, well, and uh, but you wouldn't allow the free market forces to decide which kind of uh, medium should serve them as money, should, should serve people as money. So I think the way forward would really be the, um, the, the privatization of money production and let the free market forces to decide, you know, which money they would like to use or which monies they would like to use. But there's also the sheer implausibility of having enlightened rulers that would suddenly go, oh, yeah. the problem is we've got and this paper money, we need to change the, the dollar to, to being gold. I mean, that's not going to happen. I mean, I the think. prominent role of, of the gold standard may be, can, can maybe be explained by, um, by the fact that uh, at least uh, until the early 1970s of the last century, the, the, the do US dollar was still defined uh, in, in gold, and um, that was considered as a kind of natural monetary order. And therefore, many writers, including uh, Ludwig von Mises and Mario Rothbard, always kept referring to, to, to the gold standard. But I would say uh, uh, complete privatization of money production would do the trick. And I could imagine once there's this kind of freedom in the choice of currency, people would decide, well, let's go for gold or silver or, or copper, whatever, as, as the ultimate means of payment. And with, with digital communication now and the globalization of commerce, it seems like it's a much easier undertaking. I mean... To, to have private currencies than it might have been even in the 19th century or, or 10 years ago, you know? Yeah, I mean, te uh, the techno technological uh, uh, progress really would argue in, in that direction. And you can see all over the world, I mean, the holdings of gold and silver are increasing, you know, be that in physical terms or be that through exchange-traded funds or other right. investment vehicles. So people, are, I think, are increasingly getting hold of money into the form of gold and silver. In the United States, the government is quite frequently clamping down on uh, digital currencies, for example. Uh, a new business will start while we're holding your gold and whatever, and it starts to flourish, and as soon as it starts to flourish, uh, the place gets raided by the Justice Department. I, th I think that maybe there's a half a dozen cases of this just in the last few years. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, governments want to have control of the money supply, you know, and uh, uh, it's not easy to 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 basically uh, forecast a situation in which you would have, on the one hand, uh, government-controlled uh, fiat money uh, competing against, um, let's say, free market uh, chosen currencies. The government will always try to um, to dominate, you know, in the field of money. Yes, as, uh, as long as people ascribe to that kind of monetary order. Once people, and that is something which which Mises always pointed out. It's it's at the end of the day, it's all about public opinion. You know, once people uh, want something different, 
that is basically the leverage for change. Yes. In fact, uh, just last week, I think, uh, we saw the news that a particular state, Utah, the United States, is legalizing the production of gold and silver uh, as legal yes. tender. And I'm not sure what it all means, but it's very interesting. I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah. when you look at, at monetary history again, I mean, there were so many experiments with money. Yeah. And... Uh, but the let's say the underlying trend development was, uh, or from my point of view, is that uh, sooner or later uh, people come back to to the ultimate means of payment, and that is gold and silver. Now you have a book out in German, right? Yeah, it's called money. Uh, it's called Geldreform. It's uh, in, Ger in English. It would be kind of currency or monetary reform. Okay, well, that's a uh, that's a very start of a good translation. We've got the title so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, it's like I, I, I set to work already. You know, so um, okay, let's let's see what comes out of it. Is it a big book? Uh, it's just two hundred pages in, okay. in in German, and we try to keep it as short as possible because it should uh, reach many people, uh, also laymen and not only economists. Well, uh, as you translate, remember to turn every one sentence into three. Uh, just for Americans. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way we are. <laughs> just a little tip there. <laughs> this is a cool. hell of a translation. <laughs> if it becomes a blockbuster, I or certainly, I certainly yeah, make use of your tip, advice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thorsten Polite, thank you so much for visiting with me today. And, uh, and thank you for coming all the way to Auburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Tag, for the invitation. It was my pleasure. <laughs>